Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for making it here during the lunch hour. My name is uh, Deepak Suri. I lead product management for AppStream 2.0. Uh, along with me on stage today will be Rich Perez from uh, News Corp. He'll be up, uh, during the session uh, to talk about uh, use case for AppStream uh, at his company as well. Uh, this is a 300 level session, so I'm going to start off a little high level, talk about some of the business drivers, walk through a few demos, and then go deeper into uh, the technical concepts uh, around AppStream 2.0. So first of all, uh, AppStream is a fully managed service that uh, delivers Windows applications to uh, any device with a browser. Uh, so users can connect and use multiple Windows applications all through the browser. Uh, these could be 3D applications or business applications. The key advantage with AppStream is uh, the apps and data are going to be on AWS, and the user only interacts with pixels uh, that are coming out of the apps uh, on their local device. So the benefits around AppStream, there's six benefits that I'm going to uh, uh, start off talking about. Uh, first of all, you can run Windows apps on any device, which means uh, regardless of whether you have a Mac or a Chromebook or a Linux desktop, you can still use powerful Windows applications or your line of business Windows applications. Uh, you get instant access as a user to uh, your applications. Uh, you, there's no need to install an application or request uh, approvals to install uh, on your local device. Instead, you simply go to a browser. Uh, a catalog of applications is available to you. You click on an application and just get started. Uh, for administrators, this uh, service also allows them to centralize their apps and data. So uh, there isn't a need to deploy applications to thousands and thousands of endpoints and worry about patching them. Instead, they can put their apps on AWS, uh, on AppStream, and then uh, connect, allow users to connect to their data from within their applications and have all of them working within the AWS uh, environment. Uh, another key benefit for customers is uh, around how it integrates with existing uh, IT environment. So it connects to a customer's uh, existing Active Directory, uh, it can connect to uh, existing storage mechanisms, and then also allows them to use their uh, existing security model around how they have secured all their applications and data within their network. Uh, along with all this, there is no hardware and software to manage. So uh, you can simply get started with AppStream by importing your applications and then scale it out to match the number of users that you want to deliver your applications to. Finally, it's, it's a service that provides consistent performance and, and global scale. So uh, each user gets uh, an application experience that has been uh, fixed by the administrator for them. Uh, so uh, they get the best performance from the, inst uh, from the underlying instance type they use on uh, AppStream. And also, they can use this globally. So uh, users can connect to AppStream from, their global, from in, wherever they are in the world and then connect to the closest region where AppStream is available. So if it's a company setting up AppStream in one region, then they can easily expand that to other regions and then still get the same experience for their users. Let me uh, switch now to a demo to, uh, uh, to go through how this looks for an end user. Uh, for this, I'm going to start off with, uh, let me, one second, I don't see my screen. All right, so uh, for this demo, what I'm going to walk through is a user logging in to uh, a sign-in portal. I'll sign out here and start from scratch. So. Uh, this is a portal that's been made available to me, let's say, uh, by my administrator. Uh, I've been asked to go to uh, the Okta login portal over here. Uh, this is connected to my existing Active Directory, so I just log in with my uh, Active Directory credentials. So once I sign in, then I see a list of uh, application catalogs that are available to me as a user. So over here, I'm going to select uh, uh, there's a couple here. I'll select the AppStream Graphics Pro domain. So this one's actually an environment that is connected 
to my Active Directory as well. So all the instances that uh, uh, the instance I'll connect to is actually joined to uh, the domain. Uh, it, I'll be logging in as a domain user as I do this, just like you would with a regular Windows desktop. So the first step, uh, as a first step, I'll see all the apps that are available to me. So this is the app catalog that my admin has provided. Uh, over here, I'll launch, uh, let's say, RGS. Now this environment is uh, a graphics environment, so all the applications that you see are 3D apps that uh, are going to be running on a graphics instance. So as this connects, so uh, those are just my uh, login credentials for Active Directory. I entered my credentials, just my password, and then this then launches uh, the session for me. So at this point, RGS has launched on an instance on, in AWS. So this is in the uh, Oregon region. And then I'm just going to log in here for the app. So uh, I just need to make it app stream demo user and log in. So as this launches, uh, this is a trial version of the app I used. Uh, so as this launches, you'll see that it comes up very quickly. Uh, from here, uh, I can, uh, uh, let's say I'm just a user who is working on uh, a JS user, working on some data sets. I can open an existing project uh, that I had. So I'll go to a previous project that I had open. Uh, and over here, what you see is, uh, uh, since this is a domain joint instance, I have access to uh, file shares in my network. So I have a home folder set up. So I'll go in there. Uh, and then inside that, I have a demo project that I was working on already. So I'll load that. So as this loads, so this is just a sample data set that I downloaded from uh, Washington DC's uh, 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 online site. So uh, what you see here is RGIS, of course. Uh, it's a powerful 3D application. Uh, it's using uh, uh, OpenGL uh, graphics library. It's running on a G3 instance. And for AppStream, it's a graphics pro uh, instance type. So. It's so a really powerful instance type behind the scenes. And as a user, of course, I can, I can see that I'm inside Firefox, first of all, uh, interacting with this 3D application. And then uh, let me go in and add some more data to this. Uh, so uh, let's see. Go into, I had another data set loaded as well. So here. select one, and then load. Uh, so you could see that how it overlaid uh, over uh, the existing data that I already had. Uh, hopefully, this gives you a sense of what's possible as a user. So I'm able to launch a 3D application and load up data from, uh, my, from within my file share. Uh, I'll also go through one more application. So let me launch uh, Photoshop as an example. Uh, what you have seen so far is a user working with uh, data that's on a file share. Uh, let's say I have some uh, files that are on my local client and I, and I want to work on them. Uh, so I can do that as well with AppStream. So I can go in here. So this is a way to upload and download files. So I can upload some files. Uh, I'll pick a, an image from here. And that. So this is about a 5 MB image that's down, uh, that is uploading into my instance. Uh, and once it uploads, I can take some uh, quick actions over here. So I'll close this, go into file, open. So here you'll see that I have temporary files. So this is like a scratch space I can use as a user within my streaming session. So I go into temporary files load in an image. And since this is a graphics instance uh, behind the scenes, I can, of course, uh, uh, apply some uh, filters. So let's see, I, I'll just do that very quickly. 
open that up so and once this is set up So again, uh, this was uh, just applying a, a graphics function, uh, which was uh, powering the blur filter. And then once this is done, I can then uh, s save the file. Now, I save my file. I showed you the shared file concept, uh, where I can, of course, access a file share. Uh, with AppStream, you also have the option to use uh, home folders. So we have a built-in storage option uh, called home folders. And uh, this allows the user to, uh, of course, just uh, save files here. But then the files are actually saved back to S3 uh, automatically. And the files are saved. They are all saved in a, a customer's own AWS account. So they have full control over that. So they can go into an S3 bucket and then see uh, what, app, what files are being used by each user. They can programmatically move files into their S3 bucket. But all of them become available just as a Windows folder uh, to the user. So I'll just save this. So the other thing here is uh, I actually launched Photoshop on the same instance. So one of the things you'll see here is I have both RGIS and Photoshop running uh, within the same experience. Uh, so if it's a user who has, let's say, a workflow that they have, uh, there are multiple apps that they want to use. They want to save files from one application and then open it in another. So this is the type of workflow that is enabled. Uh, they can, uh, the instance is, of course, it's a Windows instance. Uh, the clipboard is shared, so you can copy paste between uh, the applications uh, on the instance as well. Uh, you cannot have multiple display today uh, on the browser, but we can talk about that at the end. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry, there's a quick question there around can we use multiple displays? You can't use multiple displays today with the browser, uh, but if folks have questions about that, we can talk about it at the end of the session. Uh, we'll save questions towards the end if that's okay. Uh, we can run through this, and I'll, get, I'll try and save some time at the end for questions. All right, so uh, this is, again, just a quick overview of what's possible with AppStream. It's a catalog of applications that are provided to a user, and then the user can use multiple applications, save files, connect to their existing identity, and so on. Uh, now I'll switch, let me switch gears again and talk about some of the use cases that drive, uh, uh, that drive AppStream, like what's made us build the service this way. Right, so first of all, use case number one for us is uh, business applications. So uh, folks are probably familiar with uh, streaming use cases on premises. They've been doing this for maybe decades. Uh, the idea here is you want uh, you, your data to be centralized, your apps to be centralized. Uh, you can take care of patching of applications in a single location and not worry about uh, updating multiple endpoints. You have the agility of not worrying about uh, devices. You don't have to purchase the right device for the right application. Instead, you can separate out what device a user actually has from what applications they need to use. Uh, so this means users always get access to the apps that they need in the quickest possible way. Uh, the other use case for AppStream is, ar is around design and engineering. So uh, what we hear a lot from customers is how they can escape from just uh, having plain old workstations to run their GPU applications and provide their designers, engineers, artists the capability to use a cloud-based workflow uh, for their day-to-day uh, uh, -day job. So this means uh, being able to use 3D applications with, uh, with data that is generated and saved on AWS. Uh, this means you don't have to move data back and forth to, let's say, an on-prem workstation. You might use EC2 for your simulation or rendering, uh, but then you don't have to then worry about the security headaches of moving the data back and forth to your on-prem workstation. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, large benefit here is around performance, because your apps and data are co-located. Uh, you don't have uh, data sitting, let's say, a couple of thousand miles away in a file share that is centrally located. Instead, you can have this in the same AWS region, as long as it's in S3 or on an EBS, uh, EBS volume that is local to your VPC, then you can always connect to it uh, and, and use that. 
Uh, the third large use case for AppStream is around software vendors who are uh, considering multiple use cases. First of all, uh, one of the big challenges is around how they can deliver trial experience for their applications very quickly. So if you take a complex uh, 3D app, sometimes uh, you need an, a fresh workstation and, uh, and inst downloading and installing an application can take hours and hours. Instead, it's, it's, uh, you get instant gratification gratification in a way by just clicking on a button and then you get the latest version of an application that you can try out. Uh, so this helps with both marketing leads. You can put this up on a website and allow users to access your application, or you can provide that to uh, your, your field sales and then have them uh, go to customers and just provide the experience straight up, like no need to install, just click on this button. The other large use case for uh, software vendors around training. Uh, you don't have to set up physical labs to, turn, uh, to train your uh, new users uh, or uh, users on new features or a new version of the product. Instead, you can just have a virtual lab that uh, you can have users connect to and then get their training on. Uh, following this, the, uh, uh, what, uh, the other use cases uh, that software vendors consider is around uh, SaaS subscriptions. So how do you go next from, uh, once you have done the train, let's say you can do, use it for demos and workshops, but then uh, ultimately uh, an option, that sh there would be an option to have uh, uh, cloud-based subscriptions for your applications. Uh, so again, uh, this is something that uh, customers consider and, then, uh, and we build the service to match that through by having the API support to enable that. Uh, the fourth and final use case I'll talk about is around uh, education. Uh, what we hear a lot from uh, our education customers, both in higher education, uh, higher ed, and uh, K through 12, is uh, there are students who, bring, who have devices today that don't support all the applications that they need to use. So these could be uh, students who have, in K through 12, it's students using Chromebook, but they still need access to, uh, say, design software or gaming applications, uh, but they still don't want to leave the Chromebook environment. The learning should be available within that. And then in higher ed, again, uh, Macs are becoming more and more prevalent. And uh, however, the, so a lot of the engineering applications are built for Windows. So how do you deliver those applications to your uh, students? So uh, in, in both scenarios, what we hear, uh, the, the concrete use case is around uh, delivering uh, either uh, online classrooms or virtual labs where uh, you can get rid of your physical lab having, uh, let's say, hundreds of Windows machines, and then instead just use AppStream uh, as, as a way for delivering that same uh, solution virtually. So uh, how does AppStream bring all this together? So the, we think of this uh, as in terms of uh, the main pillars uh, that customers care about. Uh, there is identity, applications, and data. And all of this would come together to provide uh, a, a, a user experience that is both fluid, responsive, and secure. Uh, so for a user logging in with their identity, it should be their existing identity. Nobody wants to create a new identity to access a new set of applications or a service. Uh, using their existing identity, they should be able to use apps that they would like uh, to have access to. And from within the apps, they should have access to data that they already own. Uh, or can import easily uh, from someplace. Uh, and all of this should work securely, whether it's the application saving data or the user logging in and being entitled to the right set of applications. Uh, so diving into each of these uh, pillars a little bit, uh, first of all, with the user experience, we provide something that is uh, simple and familiar. Uh, uh, it should be no different from a user accessing their applications just on a Windows desktop. Uh, they can use multiple applications together. Uh, so this is a very common question that comes up. It's AppStream, so is it just a single app? You can, no, it's, you can actually use a, a, a number of applications. It could be your entire app workflow uh, all running together. Uh, so the user can share clipboard uh, between the applications. They can save files. They can print from within. All that is supported just like a, a, a familiar Windows experience. Uh, along with that, what makes the experience uh, responsive and fluid is the streaming protocol that we use. So for this, we use Nice DCV. It's an AWS-owned streaming protocol uh, that is encrypted end-to-end. -end. It's AES-256 encrypted, and it works over HTTPS. 
So the key advantage with that is it works over, uh, it's firewall friendly from the get-go, so you don't have to open up a specific port for saying AppStream. Uh, so when I first started on AppStream and we set it up, like we could just use it as is inside our Amazon network. We didn't have to go talk to Amazon IT to get certain ports enabled. Instead, it was just there to work, uh, work with. The user experience is consistent. So this is something I talked about earlier. Uh, it's consistent in the sense that it's, every user gets a whole virtual machine. So again, it's a single user, single virtual machine. Uh, this means uh, both the performance and security boundary is at the user level. So you don't have user, multiple users on the same virtual machine uh, becoming noisy neighbors and creating performance issues for others. Instead, it's that user on, on, on the machine just like they would have their own desktop. Uh, and finally, since this is a, a latency-sensitive service, you do need access to AppStream globally. So if you have users in Asia, for example, you want them signing in to a region closest to them and not coming in all the way uh, to a region in the US. So that is, again, something that we support, and we'll keep adding regions over time. Uh, the next big pillar is around uh, identity. So uh, we support both bring your own and built-in identity. So bring your own is, for most customers, it is Active Directory. Uh, they want to bring in, they want to connect to Active Directory, but the way we have enabled Active Directory is uh, through SAML federation. So if you use any existing SAML provider uh, or just ADFS, so that can easily connect to AppStream, just like you would connect that, uh, uh, connect the SAML provider to use the AWS console uh, today. So it's the exact same security model that we use with AppStream. Uh, the other option that you have with uh, identity is built-in. So you can also use, uh, uh, so we have a, a user pool that is included uh, inside AppStream. This is the uh, AWS Cognito user pool, but it's built into the AppStream service. So you can simply add users there uh, directly. This is useful if, let's say, you just want to uh, kick off a, a POC or uh, you don't have an active directory. Instead, you want to set this up on your own with uh, an identity that is supported uh, in-house. So, uh, uh, so the user pool uh, allows that. There is a third option that I don't talk about here on the slides, but it's custom identity where uh, you can define your identity outside of AppStream and simply call AppStream APIs to then deliver a streaming session uh, inside a browser. So if you have a website inside which you want to deliver, uh, uh, let's say, your, your Windows application, then we have an SDK that uh, you can, uh, it's part of the AWS SDK, so you can simply call an API to uh, create a URL and then post that into the browser. And then what comes before that if you, is, is up to you. You can secure access to the website using your own identity that you can create, whether it's AWS Cognito or some other identity that you have. Now, when you talk about identity, and this used to come up uh, earlier in the year when we didn't have Active Directory support, uh, so the key ask is around, does it support Active Directory, and what benefits does it have once it does? So uh, yes, it supports Active Directory, and in a traditional way. So every AppStream instance is joined to the domain, uh, just like a Windows desktop. So this means the user gets access to their network printers, their file shares, uh, and any GPO policies that need to be applied uh, by an admin can be, uh, can be applied uh, inside AppStream as well. So we've covered identity, and uh, so we've covered identity, and the next one is, is data. So uh, with data, there's multiple options again. Uh, so uh, you can uh, use persistent home folders that we provide built in, but it, the data is synced to S3 in your AWS account. Uh, you can also use network file shares, like the one I just demoed. Uh, or you can uh, upload and download from your client. If, you're, if you don't want the users to have any persistent data, you can just have them upload download files directly. So you talked about identity and data, and then applications. So with applications, uh, the way you import applications, so uh, one of the questions uh, we get asked often is, so do I have to make any changes to my apps, or how do I import my applications in, like, uh, so it's, uh, it's very easy, uh, and actually I'll walk through a, a demo as well. Uh, you get an image builder, which is a, a Windows desktop experience, inside which you can install your applications as an admin. 
And these are apps, of course, that you don't make any changes to your application. You simply install and then say, this is the type of catalog that I want to deliver to my users. Uh, so importing applications is one part. And then once the apps are imported, how do you make sure that you have the right level of performance for uh, your applications? And this can vary. Like while most of our customers select uh, one of two instance families that we have, and we have uh, we have six of them. Uh, so the, the most common ones are the standard instance family. So this is based on the T2 medium instance type today. Uh, this, is, this works really well for any business applications uh, that would usually work on a desktop. If you want to provide uh, access to that in a performant way, you can use the standard instances. Uh, the other option for running graphics applications is, uh, is the graphics design instance uh, type that we have. So these are based on virtualized GPUs. Uh, they actually come at, a, uh, at one of the lowest costs in the industry, where it, it, uh, we charge about 25 cents per hour in the US region for this. Uh, so this allows the user to uh, run any of their 3D applications, and this is a popular instance type for, for that type of use case. Uh, but there are more advanced options as well uh, available. So, uh, there are customers who have very specific requirements around, let's say, uh, if they want to run an application like Petrel, which requires, uh, which can benefit from a large amount of GPU memory. In that case, we have Graphics Pro instance type that's available. Uh, and this uses an NVIDIA M60 GPU uh, and is based on the G3 instance type today on EC2. Uh, the other option is the Graphics Desktop. Uh, this is based on the G2 instance types today. Uh, you could run applications like Fluent, uh, Ansys Fluent on that. Uh, there's more options as well, of course. There's uh, Compute Optimized, which are based on uh, popular compute instances on uh, EC2. And then Memory Optimized instances where apps require a large amount of, or can benefit from a large amount of memory. Uh, so we've talked about identity apps and data, but uh, one of the fundamental questions always is like this has to be secure. So what are the secure? What is the security model that you uh, provide? Uh, first of all, AppStream launches inside your VPC and access, has access to your network resources inside your VPC. So that is completely. Uh, so that's the security model that we adopt, like similar to other AWS services. Uh, and the access for a user to AppStream is always over HTTPS. So uh, it's so both over HTTPS and also the streaming itself is encrypted end-to-end -end using uh, AES-256. Uh, finally, the instances that a user is on are non-persistent. So we never persist the instance for a user beyond the session that they were on. For example, I just did a demo now uh, where I walked through RTS and Photoshop. Uh, once uh, I log out, that instance is, is terminated, destroyed. Uh, and uh, if I log in again, then I get a fresh instance. So from the admin perspective, this is a Windows instance that doesn't retain any data. It's terminated at the end of a session, uh, which, uh, which fits uh, for a lot of customers, it fits their security model much better. Uh, finally, for admins, uh, AppStream provides, so this, so I talked about the pillars uh, around which the end user experience is built. Uh, but how does this work for admins? So for admins, we provide uh, both a console and an SDK so that they can set up the service. Uh, and, uh, and they do not have to, uh, 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 of course, install any hardware or software. Uh, they, can, uh, they simply provide rules around how the environment scales. And I'll walk through this in a demo in a few minutes. Uh, and they can set this up in a region that is closest to their user base. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about some customer examples. So uh, who's using AppStream? So uh, uh, a customer called CompuWare is using AppStream to deliver uh, mainframe de developer tools uh, that can be almost instantly set up for, their, uh, for uh, engineers uh, on AWS. Uh, there is uh, Aviva, who uses uh, AppStream as the uh, training uh, to deliver a training portal online. So uh, they deliver a powerful 3D application called E3D uh, using AppStream. And this is a, a website that users go to and then uh, create an account. They could be an existing customer or a new customer. They, they use the training portal to get trained on the latest version of an application. Uh, finally, in the university space, uh, in higher ed, 
uh, this Cornell University that uses uh, uh, application like Ansys Fluent. Uh, there's, actually, there's a few YouTube videos that uh, Cornell University has put up. Uh, it, it's very interesting how uh, uh, it describes how online learning could completely change when a customer uses a uh, uh, source like AppStream to deliver a powerful application like, uh, like Fluent. Uh, so with that, I actually want to continue the customer examples by introducing uh, Rich Perez uh, from News Corp. Uh, to talk about how AppStream is used within the News Corp environment. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk in the next few slides about how, how News Corp um, have adopted AppStream and how they, how they plan to do so more so in the future as well. I'll just spend a second explaining who News Corp are, for those you don't know. News Corp is a multinational media company focusing on publishing um, newspapers and books. News Corp it consists of around nine different business units together, forming around 24,000 uh, users. Um, so naturally, there's uh, varying different user requirements, business requirements, uh, and together we're faced with a challenge to, to try and meet all of those. I'll tell you where, where we started. So we, we had an on-prem VDI solution, and one particular business unit uh, back in 2015 adopted workspaces to, uh, to start removal of the on-prem solution. Rather than go down to the granular level of trying to identify each and every uh, use case, we took a step back and identified three. First one was the constant use, which was um, a persistent work um, desktop experience acts in a particular um, highly sensitive application, which consisted of, of um, essentially just some, some data. Now, it was important that we, the data didn't remain on that endpoint, and it al always remained in AWS. The second example was a third party and partners. So this is access typically from a remote location and only really intermittent use on a device that we do not manage. So therefore, it was really important for us that they were able to access our internal resources securely without ever any chance of any data residing back onto that endpoint, which I said is a non-corporate device that we didn't manage. And then thirdly, there was an intermittent use or infrequent use. Now, as a cloud-first initiative business, um, quite a lot of our products are now SaaS-orientated. So for me, as a, as a good example of this, my day-to-day -day activity is typically just, just working on a, on a SaaS product. Now, from time to time, I do need in, uh, access to our on-prem um, applications. And then I will typically go into a workspace, spin up a session, do what I would do, for example, a procurement tool, approve a PO, and then I'd log out and then go back to my normal desktop experience. So, so the business drivers behind what we do is the bottom two, as you'll see there, are, are, are kind of applicable to, to any product or any solution um, that we all have. One is securing the user, the user identity, um, securely accessing the, the application, and of course, the data. The business continuity, uh, cl clearly, it's, it's a world where we now have options with AppStream whereby we can scale up and down accordingly, subject to the, the nature of the of what's invoked the, the BCP at the time. A couple others I'll draw your attention to is the use case optimization. So we, we took a very high level of what we wanted um, from our use cases. However, we are constantly being challenged to make sure that whatever app stream that we are intending to apply is the right size, so not to compromise that user experience. So having information and data that, that profiles a user, so what are they using? how are they using it, and how many people are using it at the same time, therefore determines what kind of instance that we are prepared to, to, um, to assign that user. I'll draw you to the next gen workplaces uh, driver. This is a global initiative where we're trying to improve the user proposition. We're trying to support flexible working, uh, mobility, 
from a, from, a, from a flexible perspective, but also accommodating our user demands, having hundreds of journalists scattered around the world in some remote places is, is quite clearly and paramount. AppStream, along with some other products and some, some controls, is a, is a real good enabler for, for that kind of initiative. So why have we chosen AppStream? I've just selected three different areas, um, which is operational security and then some commercial pieces. And I've, under each of those, I've provided some examples. But I want to draw your attention to, to a couple, couple others. Now, AppStream is a managed service. You purchase that managed service. So my, the teams globally don't really have to concern themselves with the provisioning of the, of the fleet instances that are required. And that's pretty much left, uh, left, to, um, left to AWS. We don't really have to worry about um, application update management. We do from a perspective of publishing the application in AppStream, but I don't have to concern myself with anything on the, on the endpoints anymore. The other thing I'd mention, which is in part a, a user experience as, as, as well as like a business efficiency one, and that is I don't have to, users typically don't really need a, a persistent desktop experience anymore. Through familiarity with the, you know, the personal right through to business, we now work in a, typically in, a, in an area where people can access, uh, for us it's, it's Okta, um, an identity provider. They're presented with a series of applications and they can just click on those and, and move on. Rarely now we're finding that a desktop experience is not needed. From a security perspective, it supports um, identity federation, and as an identity provider, as I mentioned, we use Okta. So this, again, is a, a really slick user experience. We protect the data, we protect the user identity, and we protect the, the actual user themselves, in so much as they log onto their Okta portal, they're presented with the whole corporate applications, and then from there they can access AppStream and further on-premise um, applications. From a uh, from a cost perspective or a commercial perspective, there is an advantage to us. We we're able to move from a, a capex, or gradually, shall I say, move from a capex to, a, to an opex, uh, opex model. We were also able to scale up and down accordingly, so that didn't have to concern ourselves with, a, with any particular hardware. But I also add something else which, I th which we found uh, really insightful and really useful, is that by understanding the, the user profile, what they're using, when are they using it, and for how, uh, for how long. Um, and also getting down to a fourth layer, which is how intense are they using that application. By understanding that, you can actually right size your licensing requirements. You can, there was an example where we shifted from having like 1,500 concurrent licenses for a particular application, and we're able to shrink that down accordingly just because we realized that there was not that much use for it. And also understanding and not applying the same rule for all. So if a user's using a particular application, we discovered there was over 100 different use cases for that single application. So, and they use it for very different, in very, uh, very different ways. So some may have been very light touch, so therefore we can just give them an instance that, that reflected that, or they've been more graphical and more intense, so we had to plan for that accordingly. The other thing I'll add as well, and we're still heavily using workspaces, is the realization that a workspace um, doesn't really apply just for a set of users and an app stream applies for another bunch of users. There may be some use cases, justifiably so, that actually a user requires both. It just depends what the activity they work on at that one time. And if, for those of you that are working on business cases, it's probably worth, consider, uh, it's probably worth consideration when you look at that as well. So that's how News Corp um, used um, AppStream. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, next, I'm going to dive into uh, the setup and management of AppStream and talk about a few more technical concepts. Uh, I'm going to stay literally high level, relatively high level. There's a chalk talk scheduled after the session, and there's also a workshop. Uh, please do attend that if you have time. We go pretty deep into setting up AppStream in those sessions. Uh, but let me start with the admin workflow here. So uh, the key concepts that an admin uh, 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 learns and uses with AppStream are, first of all, uh, they have an admin desktop into which they install their applications. 
Uh, once they install their applications, then they create a golden image or an image containing their catalog of apps. Uh, once the image is available, uh, then uh, they can always launch this image again as an image builder, update the applications if they'd like, but the image is there to then launch uh, of, uh, uh, to serve a catalog of apps to their users. Uh, so this image can then be translated into a fleet. So a fleet is a, an autoscale group of EC2 instances uh, containing uh, each user's applications. Uh, so when launching a fleet, uh, an admin would pick the instance type uh, that they would use based on the application catalog. If it's uh, business applications, maybe they select the standard instance type, or if it's uh, 3D applications, they select graphics design. Uh, once they've done that, they wrap the fleet around in a logical concept called a stack. So the stack is where an admin sets permissioning. So if, let's say if they are connect, uh, uh, connecting uh, through SAML, so the resource that a user would access is the stack. So uh, it sep this separates out the fleet, which is the physical resource containing the apps from the logical resource uh, containing uh, all the policies. Uh, in, so uh, access is one of them, but it could also include, say, storage. So you could set up a storage policy at the stack level. Uh, so once you set these up, the network flow that uh, a customer uh, uh, that uh, uh, that a customer would see uh, uh, looks like this. So I'll walk through each of these here. Uh, but at a high level, there's uh, a VPC that's maintained by uh, the by the upstream service where the customer instances are getting launched, uh, and they have a network connection into their own uh, VPC. Uh, and then there's uh, of course there's identity. Uh, that could be on-prem or it could be a SAML provider. So starting with the authentication for a user. So a user would authenticate against their uh, SAML provider uh, or it could be ADFS, Okta, or Ping, any, or any similar service like that. Uh, once they're authenticated, then the next step after that is the streaming connection is established. Uh, and the streaming connection is established from the end user's browser to AppStream, the uh, connection flows through a streaming gateway, uh, which is provided by the AWS application load balancer. So we use that as the gateway service. And uh, a tunnel is established to an instance uh, that is reserved for that user for the period, for the duration of that session. Uh, so uh, once, the, uh, once the user signs in, uh, they can launch applications within that instance. So that's what's presented as part of their application catalog. So from within the instance, they can access network resources are, that are inside the uh, customer's VPC. So let's say it's a client server application with, a, with the server sitting inside uh, your VPC. So from within the application, you have access to that because you have a network interface in, that is uh, part of uh, a subnet that you select. So also from within the uh, user's instance, they have access to uh, storage. So uh, this storage could, of course, be a file share that is in your uh, VPC, or it could be uh, the home folders that are uh, provided using Amazon S3. So diving into the instance a little more. So each instance has two network interfaces, uh, and we use one, in one interface uh, to stream all the pixels uh, to the user and also accept keyboard and mouse uh, inputs back. Uh, another interface is uh, connected to the customer's own VPC uh, and can be associated with a security group in their VPC as well uh, to restrict access to resources uh, inside that. So let me go through the console uh, and talk about these concepts. So we've talked about uh, image builder, fleets, and stacks. So uh, let's see, I have to switch this again. So how does this look on the uh, console? So I'm going to quickly walk through each of these concepts. Uh, so where you would start as an administrator is with the images tab. So here uh, you have an image builder. So the image builder is the uh, Windows desktop experience that you can connect to and install applications as an admin. 
So to launch an image, so you can launch an image builder by setting, by first of all selecting a base image. So you can you start with a base image that doesn't have any applications, it's provided by AWS, or you could start with an image that has your applications already and you are going to update the, uh, patch the applications or are going to add new ones or remove others. So let's say I pick one of these images and so next step, I can give this image builder a name. So with each image builder, I, I would want to test out the applications on the instance type that I'm going to provide my user. So I can pick any of the instance types and sizes that are available. So in this case, I picked an image that will work with graphics design instance. So, and within that, I have four different options for the instance size. Uh, once I have that, I can select the VPC inside which this image builder will launch and also the subnet that it will connect to. Uh, and I can also apply up to five security groups. So if you want to apply uh, network controls at the instance level, you can do that through this. Uh, another option is also to connect these instances, even the image builder, to your domain. So uh, you may want to connect your image builder to a domain and then maybe uh, use SCCM event to just uh, automatically install applications using an automated workflow. So this actually allows you to join the image builder automatically to a domain. Uh, here you would select the, uh, the directory configuration uh, that uh, that you have already set up with AppStream, and then also an OU that the image builder will belong to. Uh, so, should of course be the review, uh, I'm, and you can launch this. Uh, I'm, once you launch, you'd go back to the uh, image builder screen. So, uh, I'll just go into a running image builder to uh, uh, to demo what that looks like. So, I can connect to the image builder directly from within the console. So this is a running image builder that has some apps already installed. So you can see that uh, there's a, a bunch of applications. This was one of the image builders that we used to create the demo experience, the demo catalog. So within the image builder, uh, once you have installed your applications, similar to how you would install them on any Windows desktop, you can then add applications using an image assistant. So uh, here, let's say you want to, uh, I'll just remove an application and add another. So uh, let's say I want to add uh, IE as an example. So let's say I pick Photoshop as an example. Uh, and then you can save this, of course. And once you save the, uh, save the list of apps that you're adding, then they'll show up over here. Uh, and, uh, as you, and then you can move through a few steps uh, as part of the image creation. First of all, uh, you can test all the uh, applications that you, have, uh, uh, that you have installed, make sure that they work within the AppStream experience. Uh, two callouts here, the apps are running on an instance type and profile that is going to be the same for the user. So you can select the same. And second part is, this is using the same streaming protocol. So this is also using nice DCV. So whatever the user sees in terms of the streaming experience eventually is gonna be the same. So the admin is testing with the exact same uh, uh, the streaming protocol. Uh, so as I click next, so this would then launch each application and as each application launches, uh, the, uh, uh, we do an optimization uh, step where we capture what files are being loaded by an application so that we can pre-warm an instance eventually for a user. So that'll uh, end up speeding up the app launch experience for the user eventually uh, when you get to a, a, a streamed instance. So each application launches and then I would basically hit, uh, make sure that uh, I can open the app, make sure that the basic functions are already working, and then once that's done, I can hit continue to say, okay, I've captured all the information needed for optimizing the application. So 
So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this part of the demo and uh, at the end of the image assistant, uh, what you'd see is an option to create an image. And once you create an image, uh, you basically give it an image name and then you should go back to the uh, uh, images screen. So on the image registry, you'll see the list of images that are uh, available to you. Uh, so here is an example image that was created from the same uh, image builder. And here you'll see the list of apps that are uh, already available. So once the images are uh, created, then you can then go in and launch a fleet. So when you launch a fleet, a similar concept as uh, the image builder. So you can do, I'll just name it fleet demo. I'll pick one of the images. Uh, pick an instance type. The additional option that you'll see with fleet is uh, what type of fleet experience you want. On demand is when uh, we launch instances and keep them in a standby mode so that you don't get charged unless a user is streaming. And there's always on mode where the instances are launched and kept warm and running so that when a user connects to them, uh, the instance is already up and running. So there's no instance launch, instance start time. Uh, along with that, you can also define the scaling policies for a user, uh, for the fleet. So you can decide that I want a minimum uh, concurrency of let's say 10 and a maximum concurrency of 100. And then within scaling details, one of the benefits AppStream provides is a scaling policy. So this is similar to EC2 auto scaling, where you can provide a scaling policy for uh, depending on how many users are already signed in, you can keep increasing your fleet size over time. Or if your fleet is underutilized, let's say you have, a you have 50 instances available and can support a concurrency of 50, but only five users are signed in, then you can detect that and automatically start to reduce your fleet size uh, so that you can uh, save on costs. Uh, also with the fleet, you can, uh, again, similar to the image builder, you can select the uh, VPC and subnets that this would be part of. So I'll select a couple of uh, subnets. And then uh, you can also select the Active Directory configuration that this would connect to. So again, select the uh, directory config and then the OU to which all your Windows instance will belong to uh, as AppStream launches. Uh, so I'll cancel out of this and go to a fleet that's already available. So in this case, you see uh, reInvent demo fleet. That's domain joined. Uh, I believe this is the one I was using for the demo earlier. And here you'll see details around the fleet and also uh, it shows you how many uh, users were uh, connected at any time uh, and if there was, uh, and, and how much uh, concurrency can be supported, how much uh, utilization is there at any time. These uh, metrics here, like how much capacity is available or how much is in use, can also be used as inputs for your scaling policies. So uh, what you entered through the console as based on utilization, add so many instances, these are the metrics that you would be using. Uh, these are of course available through the console, so you can set up, uh, there are simple options to enter these in the console, but all of these are available through the SDK as well, and you can get uh, really creative with how you launch and uh, scale these fleets. Uh, including using uh, scheduled functions. For example, uh, the, back, the, uh, the service behind the scenes over here is any scale or application scaling. And you can use scheduled functions through application scaling to say, I want a fleet to start up at 8 a.m. and then shut down at 6 p.m. and only have the cost during that period. Very quickly, I mentioned Active Directory. So, uh, the way you set up Active Directory with AppStream is you simply provide the directory config for the environment uh, uh, to, in, uh, to AppStream. So you would provide the directory name and uh, the service account to use for uh, joining instances to a domain and also the OU that the instances will connect to. Uh, this is, uh, you could use AWS directory services or it could just be a, a Windows domain that is accessible from your network. So there isn't a, a dependency on using, say, a, an AD connector or a, or a Microsoft AD on AWS. You, this could be any domain that is accessible from uh, within your VPC. Uh, so once you set up your directory config, this becomes available for your image builder and fleet to connect to. With that, let me switch back to the slides to wrap this up. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to talk about two things, pricing and, uh, and, uh, our piece, and uh, features that we have launched uh, in this year that I would like, your, like to call your attention to. Uh, first of all, with pricing, there's uh, two uh, things to be aware of. Uh, there's a per user pricing where uh, you pay a, a user fee for uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that's uh, used to cover the Microsoft uh, license cost for <coughs> excuse me for the uh, remote desktop sal. Uh, but you're also you also have an option to bring this uh, uh, license yourself through a BYOL model uh, using license mobility. Uh, other than this, you are also charged for the streaming instances on an hourly basis. Your uh, streaming resources can scale automatically uh, based on the amount of usage uh, using the scaling policies that uh, I just talked about. And the price per streaming instance is, uh, is per hour. So for a graphics instance, it starts from 25 cents per hour. and for Non-graphics, it starts at 10 cents per hour. With fleets, there's two options that you can use. There is the always on fleet type where you have warm resources. This provides an instant on experience. So if you, have, you, if you want your users to simply click on an app and it instantly connects, that's the uh, always on experience. The benefit is instant connectivity, but you're carrying the cost of a running instance that is warm uh, and, is, and you're being charged for that. The other option is an on-demand where when, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when a user clicks on an app, an instance is reserved for them automatically, and then they see a delay of up to a minute, um, a minute to two minutes, uh, before when the streaming session starts. So uh, this is uh, basically there's a stopped EC2 instance that's available with a catalog of apps for the user. And when the user clicks on the app, we start that instance and then start the streaming session. And the instance is reserved for a user as soon as they click on uh, the app launch. The benefit here is that you don't have a running resource, so we only charge for the, uh, the stopped instance cost. In this case, it's uh, two and a half cents per, uh, per hour uh, in the US regions. Uh, finally, let me talk about uh, the, uh, uh, what, what we have launched so far this year. So AppStream is about, uh, it, we launched at reInvent last year, AppStream 2.0. Uh, and since then, we have had a ton of feedback, of course, from our customers. And uh, we have launched many of the features that folks were waiting on and have been asking for through the year. Uh, first of all, with applications, we have an interactive image builder. Uh, with identity, you have access to uh, full Active Directory support and SAML 2.0 federation. Uh, with uh, GPUs, you have multiple options for using graphics instances with AppStream. This includes the graphics design instance types, which I mentioned uh, start from 25 cents an hour, but you also have uh, more high power instances, uh, including those based on the G3 uh, instance type on EC2. Uh, with pricing, when we launched, we didn't have scaling options. Uh, we also didn't have the on-demand fleet options. So those are uh, features that we launched uh, uh, this year. So you have the ability to auto-scale your fleet to match amount of usage and save on costs. Uh, and you also have the on-demand option where you're only paying uh, for the streaming uh, when, the act the, when a user is actually connected. So uh, we expect to continue this, this space over the next few years as we hear more from customers about the different use cases that we have. Uh, so we are very excited about that. And uh, I want to wrap this up by, by saying it, it's always going to come back to this, these pillars for us around identity, apps, and data, and how do we make this secure so that we can provide an awesome and fluid user experience. Thank you. I have a couple of minutes. I'm happy to take questions, but uh, can also have a sidebar. Uh, how can you say as a, you know, say, uh, application connected over naturally, and somehow like, you know, the internet shuts off, and I'm going to connect back to the internet? How does that work out? So the question is, uh, what happens if a user loses connectivity uh, on the network? Let's say your Wi-Fi drops, or you're going between conference rooms, and you lose a connection. Uh, with AppSync, the session is still continuing. Uh, you don't actually exit the session 
unless you say that you want to exit or you want to uh, or it runs out of a, a timer. So you're, as an admin, you can set a timer for how much time a session is active if there's no activity, and then the instance automatically disconnects. I'm sorry. Uh, it is not. Uh, I, I can't talk about compliance uh, on our roadmap, but happy to talk to you offline. Can you touch on the, the thing you, you mentioned network printing works, but uh, is there any, any sort of client printer mapping functionality? Uh, so the question is around printing, and uh, I'm guessing local printers. Uh, so uh, since this is the browser, the browser is a secure container. So it doesn't let allow access to local resources directly. So the, uh, the solution right now is uh, when you print from within the AppStream experience, you'll see an AppStream printer. You can print to that, and that creates a PDF that you can download and then print. Or you can print to a network printer. If, the, if your domain joined, then the network printer will show up just like a, a regular network printer on a Windows desktop. Uh, there's one there. So. Yes? Yes, so uh, absolutely. So AppStream connects. The question is whether AppStream connects to resources in your own network and your VPC. Yes, uh, that is, in fact, one of the building blocks for the service. You can always have a user connect to whether it's a file share or it's a client server app or even an on-prem resource that you want to connect to or an intranet application, so that's possible. So two questions. The printer thing, that uh, I'm sorry? The, the printer uh, sort of applies to other hardware as well, right? Because it's through the browser. So. Yes, that is right. So, uh, yes, so in the browser, th there is one limitation around access to uh, peripheral devices. Uh, but uh, it, it, there are advantages in working in the browser, but one of the disadvantages could be around the peripheral devices. Yes. So, uh, <coughs> Actually, I'm out of time, so happy to have a sidebar. Thank you, everyone.